Hey, hello, everybody, and uh, thanks for joining us for a little Thyroid Wednesday today. Yeah, that abroad thing, I just got back actually Sunday from lecturing for a week in the beautiful country of Belize. So if you never had a chance to get down there, I, I'd highly recommend it. We had a great time. So I was looking at all the people that are here. Thanks for signing up. We've got a great crowd today. I don't see that my landscaper has signed in yet, but uh, he may join us. Usually on Wednesdays, he likes to cut lawn right when I'm on air. So the Oswald Underground Studio gets a little noisy sometimes. All right, guys, well, we're here to talk about hypothyroidism today. And uh, I had two titles for this talk. If it's free, it's for me, and that's a good one. We'll uh, see what you guys think about free T4s a little bit later. And then there's a lot more than just T4. Uh, again, kind of telling us, hey, there's more than one test that we can certainly look at. Obviously, you guys are here for a sponsored talk by Zometica today, so I do have a commercial relationship with them. Uh, as uh, Susan said, I'm an Ohio State and Colorado State lineage for me, and so hopefully if we have any Buckeyes or Rams out there, good afternoon. All right, guys, so let's take a look at uh, where we start with this talk. You know, in internal medicine, one of the big things that was driven into me uh, early in my residency is a medical saying that actually comes out of the medical field, the human medical field, that common things occur commonly in medicine and, and rare things occur rarely. I mean, that certainly, you know, makes sense. I think in our uh, field, in veterinary medicine, we oftentimes say, what if you hear hoofbeats, uh, think horses, don't think zebras. This poor zebra that I have on here over to your right really didn't get the message. Uh, rare things occur rarely. I think that must be exceptionally rare since he hardly has any stripes at all. But when it comes to making an endocrine diagnosis like hypothyroidism, this is an important thing to remember because hypothyroidism is actually one of the most overdiagnosed diseases we see in canine medicine simply because uh, we sometimes forget the fact that we need to see common things to help us make this diagnosis. So what are those common things when it comes to a diagnosis like hypothyroidism? Well, you wanna have a, a common features involving your history and clinical signs. Your diagnostic findings should have a number of very common features, and we'll go through all of these. And then you should have specific diagnostic laboratory findings, which in this case will be things like T4, free T4, and TSH. And then lastly, don't forget that you also need to see what should be measured as an appropriate response to whatever the specific therapy you're using. So again, we wanna be careful that we don't get too far in the weeds. We wanna to remember to always look for common features when it comes to hypothyroidism. Okay, so let's get into thyroid disease. So in dogs, and we'll speak mostly about dogs today, Primary hyperthyroidism is about 95% of the cases. And that's pretty equally split between what we'll consider uh, atrophy of the thyroid gland. Usually it occurs as that patient ages for unknown factors. And then we have destruction, which is usually an immune-mediated lymphocytic thyroiditis, which in many cases has been shown to be genetically uh, predispositions. But that's about 50-50. There's rare cases where we might see the thyroid gland get destroyed from something like neoplasia. But again, usually it's either atrophy uh, or lymphocytic thyroiditis. And what you basically see is a nice healthy thyroid gland here with all that pink um, thyroid hormone in the follicles. And then you see a patient that's got end-stage thyroid disease where the gland is either atrophied or destroyed, but you see very little production of end-stage, you know, thyroxin in a patient like this. Only about 5% of cases are probably secondary, and those are much easier to define because they have obvious clinical signs because they have to, or they deal with pituitary uh, destruction or pituitary malfunction. So you expect to see other clinical signs, especially neurologic in those cases. Okay, so the common picture First thing I wanna make sure we are aware of is that when you look at dogs that get hypothyroidism, most are adults, it's a rare disease, but it has been reported as young as six months of age and as old as 15 years of age. But most patients are pretty solidly middle-aged, you know, that three to eight year uh, uh, age range. There is no gender predisposition. It tends to occur more commonly in medium to larger size breeds when you go back and you look at 
uh, some of the prevalence data that was published back in the uh, 1990s. And these were the breeds back then in the United States that they talked about being most prevalent. And again, I want you to take this with a grain of salt because bottom line is hypothyroidism, even though these are the common breeds, it can still occur in any breed of dog, big or small breed, any male or female, again, and, and really at any age. So and truly, there may not be a common picture for the actual signalment. Uh, it was updated last year or two years ago in Britain. Uh, they published a new paper talking about the breeds that have the highest prevalence. Most of them, many of them were British dogs that we just don't see in the U.S. So unfortunately, their data set doesn't really fit for us. But again, back in the last 20 years or so, these are the breeds that we've most commonly associated this disease with. Now, these things do hold pretty true. What is the common picture as far as clinical signs go? You know, the most common signs we see are dermatologic. About 88%, almost 90% of dogs with hypothyroidism will have some dermatologic uh, abnormalities. And we'll define those in just a minute. Uh, about 50% of these patients have a noticeable weight gain. They're not all obese like you see this puppy here. But again, they certainly have, for most owners, a noticeable body condition score change and weight gain. About half of them exhibit mental changes in the form of general lethargy, or people will describe just dull mentation. They're just not their normal self. Reduced activity levels or actual weakness only occurs in a little bit over 10%, about 12% in the surveys that were done. We classically think about cold intolerance as being a sign of hypothyroidism. It didn't even really make it on the percentage list. So I think it's something that we see fairly uncommonly. But if your dog sleeps in front of the refrigerator and usually didn't do that, it's not because they're looking for cold. They're looking for that warm air that blows out when your refrigerator is working. Uh, but again, I think that one is maybe a little bit overblown. Now, no one sign on this list is pathognomonic, because you could certainly give me a whole list of differentials for each one of these common signs. But again, you start seeing them together, and it starts to build that common picture. I said we wouldn't talk much about cats, and, and we're not going to, but it does occur. Spontaneous hypothyroidism has been now reported and published in cats. In 2019, Dr. Peterson wrote a paper with seven cats, and he then uh, added one six months later to this picture. But in felines, uh, a little bit different set of clinical signs. Most of them have palpable thyroid goiters. Many of them are PUPD, which we don't really see as a feature in dogs. Again, they have that hair coat, weight gain, mental dullness, and so forth. When it comes to those dermatologic signs I mentioned, again, about almost 90% have some form of these changes. The most common ones would be non peritic alopecia, or in some cases, maybe they've gone to the groomer or to the veterinarian, and maybe somebody has clipped them for a catheter or clipped them for some medical procedure, an ultrasound, and that hair just doesn't grow back normally. So post-clip alopecia, as well as that symmetrical, uh, again, non peritic usually it's more truncal, oftentimes the face and the distal limbs may be less affected. A real dry, dull, scaling hair coat, probably seen in over 20% of the cases. And then you start seeing some things that are more random, like skin hyperpigmentation. Occasionally, the hair coat will become much lighter. If you're a dark-haired breed, you may see sort of a lighter color dilution, if you will. And then we do see some secondary things, like infection of both the skin, pyoderma, and the ears. But again, those are seen more you know, likely 10 15% of the patients. Just like we said before, no one dermatologic sign is pathognomonic for thyroid dysfunction. But again, you start putting several of these together along with those other common clinical signs and you start to paint this picture. Just to highlight again, in cats, dermatologic signs are not as common, uh, about 60%. And again, it's that unkempt dull hair coat, uh, hair thinning, again, usually truncal, maybe some flaky dandruffy type skin for cats that are affected with this. Now, we sometimes spend a lot of times talking about things that are much less common that may be associated with hypothyroidism, but these things happen much less commonly, and in many cases have not been proven to be caused by hypothyroidism. They may just occur in some patients 
at the same time, they have two distinct disorders. So things like lipid corneal deposits, you know, in the cornea of the eye can occur in a lot of different diseases, but occasionally they can be seen with hypothyroidism. Again, the association is, doesn't prove that it's caused by that. Low heart rates, neurologic signs like peripheral neuropathy weaknesses, peripheral vestibular disease, uh, megaesophagus, esophageal motility disorders, laryngeal paralysis, and even seizures have all been talked about as does thyroid cause those diseases? Again, probably not a causation, but there are some patients that can have, again, thyroid disease and exhibit these neurologic dysfunctions. Uh, again, if you have a strong picture and you have vestibular disease and neuropathy, it certainly uh, is worthwhile testing for thyroid disease. Reproductive disorders also seem to get uh, blamed on thyroid a lot. Uh, certainly, we see things like lower birth weights and the higher mortality in patients that have hypothyroidism. But again, the ability to make sperm, to get pregnant, patients can still do that. So again, it's difficult to prove that thyroid disease causes reproductive things, but it can be, again, there is an association there. All right, lastly then, common laboratory things, things you're looking at that again would be commonly seen in addition to these clinical signs, these uh, dermatologic signs. The most common things would be fatty blood, so hyperlipidemia. And again, uh, it's kind of equally divided. Uh, these patients are greater than almost 75 to 80%, almost 90% for high triglyceride levels, also high cholesterol. They tend to be sort of a pan hyperlipidemia, if you will, both, uh, both of these molecules affected. That's the number one common laboratory thing. As far as other things we see, non-regenerative anemia seen just in under half the percentage or half the cases of hypothyroidism. It's not something where you expect to see a real severe anemia. These are patients that are just marginally anemic. You know, they might be in the mid 30s or low 30 hematocrits. Uh, liver enzymes are even less commonly elevated. Uh, there are some patients with thyroid that have high ALK fosses. Very rarely would it be a high ALT value. So although we sometimes think of, of high liver enzymes as being a common thing, with thyroid disease, it's actually less common. Okay, so those are the common things we look for. So when you start putting that picture together of maybe a breed association, clinical signs, laboratory signs, again, dermatologic in dogs, you may catch these patients anywhere during a spectrum of disease. I mean, your thyroid disorder has to start somewhere over here to the left. And in those dogs, they're still gonna look very normal. They may be developing thyroid antibodies if they're a lymphocytic thyroiditis case, but there may be nothing else that really tips us off this early on. As time goes on and that gland starts to get destroyed or atrophied, you're probably gonna start seeing mild clinical signs develop. And uh, if we follow this guy running across a track, as he then proceeds on to the right side and we start getting more moderate to severe destruction, or atrophy of the gland, we're gonna start expecting to see those common clinical signs. Uh, again, that weight gain, those dermatologic signs as you see what this Labrador uh, the retriever, a golden retriever has now become compared to what they used to look like. So again, just remember that you can catch yourself or catch a patient anywhere along this. So the more early you catch them, sometimes your level of suspicion isn't as great. And again, you'll have to dig deeper into um, confirmatory pictures or confirmatory lab results if you wanna make the diagnosis that early on. We're not gonna say a lot today for time brevity about thyroid antibodies. We'll stick more with our regular hormones. So let's get into the diagnosis of hypothyroidism. First thing, is it overdiagnosed? Absolutely it is. And that's because we see way too many false positives and that is because there are lots of other reasons that your thyroid values like T4 and free T4 can be suppressed. Not every patient that has those suppressed will be a hypothyroid individual. Lots of false positives is the bottom line. So again, that's why you want to test. And this is a great take home message. You really only want to test patients for hypothyroidism that you believe have the disease. You shouldn't just be screening the general population. Uh, so when a laboratory comes to you and says, hey, we can add on a T4 for just a few more dollars to every chemistry panel you run, 
while that sounds like a great idea, it really isn't because again, you will overdiagnose hypothyroidism because you're going to be testing a lot of normal patients that may have their T4s marginally suppressed for some other reason, as we'll see. So again, who do you test for hypothyroidism? You test common things, just like we said on the first slide, common things that occur commonly, common clinical signs, common dermatologic signs, common laboratory signs like hyperlipidemia. If you put several of those together in your case, that's the perfect patient to test. So when the picture fits or when OJ, what, when the glove fits or Cinderella, when the slipper fits, those are the patients we want to be testing uh, specifically for hypothyroidism. Uh, when we get those less common conditions, it just depends on your level of suspicion. If you have corneal lipid infiltrates or neurologic signs, um, things of that nature, then again, you have to look at a broader picture. Does the patient have other things that make you think they're hypothyroid? If they do, it's well worth testing in those cases. The key thing is, though, because there's only an association with many of those, even if you define hypothyroid in those less commonly associated conditions, it doesn't necessarily mean that treatment will make those things go away because, again, they may very well just be separate entities. I already mentioned that you really shouldn't just add on T4s because you can. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you always should is a Something my mother told me long ago, and she's very right about that, keeps you out of trouble. But uh, again, we want to be careful with adding on T4s in patients where the picture doesn't fit. You're going to get misdiagnoses. It may actually delay your finding of whatever that patient truly has wrong. You get, may get led down the path to treating hypothyroidism in a patient who doesn't have it. And again, uh, when you treat, it's not necessarily benign. If you treat a patient that doesn't have hypothyroidism, you're giving a catabolic hormone and there can certainly be adverse effects, cost associated with that when you're, when you're treating something the patient doesn't truly have. So again, remember common things, they have common things, those are the pictures, those are the clients we're gonna test or the patients for it. So thyroid diagnostics, let's talk about those. The hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis is very similar to many of the other endocrine axes. It's a closed circuit, it's a negative feedback system, and it's tightly regulated. The body wants to have just enough thyroid to do the job it needs to do, doesn't want to overproduce. And at the same time, uh, if it is lacking in it, uh, the body says, hey, we need to make more. It knows how to trigger uh, the glands to then produce more thyroid. So very tightly regulated, again, a classic closed feedback endocrine loop. So when you look at what it does, uh, again, TRH and TSH are formed in the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, and those are the hormones that will stimulate our thyroid gland to produce T4, thyroxine. Then that T4 will, of course, go out through the bloodstream to the rest of the body. Uh, it'd be absorbed into the body and uh, converted to T3, and then we have normal thyroid uh, metabolic effects in you name the organ or you name the tissue, they all respond. Uh, thyroid uh, hormone has functions in almost every tissue in the body. If we, uh, again, don't have enough of that thyroid or we have too much, it feeds back negatively or positively to the brain. And then we can either shut down that production if we have enough thyroid, or we can ask for it to ramp it up and make more if we need to. Now with hypothyroidism, since it's a primary disease in most cases, we get that atrophy or destruction here of this dog's thyroid gland in his neck. And because he's now no longer able to make sufficient thyroid, normally there'd be a feedback that would ask the brain to make more. And again, it will. The brain is still intact in this situation. So it's going to make more TRH and more TSH especially trying to stimulate that gland to do its job, but unfortunately it just can't keep up. So one of the hallmark things you can tell right away for diagnosing dysfunction of this axis in hypothyroidism will be a deficiency in T4 corresponding to an increase in TSH, trying to make more hormone. And there's what our poor patient looks like who's got primary hypothyroidism. I think he used to be a Labrador. I'm not sure if that's a wild feral pig in Florida or if that's a uh, bear cub maybe in Colorado that's coming out of hibernation now. So that poor dog certainly looks like a 
poster child for thyroid disease. So once you suspect the patient has hypothyroidism, how do you go about proving it? If we all had thyroid scintigraphy, it would be wonderful. That would be the definitive test where we could give a radioactive nucleotide. We could show here the normal uptake in this patient's thyroid glands. These are salivary glands up here, not eyes. Uh, and you can see in a patient that doesn't have thyroid gland, it's been destroyed or atrophied, there's just no uptake. That is the definitive test. I'm sure probably everyone on this phone call today or Zoom meeting probably doesn't have this in their office. I certainly never did. But this would be the way that you could definitively, without a doubt, run one test and say that patient has hypothyroidism. When I was a younger internist, we used to be able to use either TSH or TRH, the hormones made by the uh, pituitary gland and the thyroid, I'm sorry, the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus, and go ahead and stimulate or try to stimulate the thyroid glands. Unfortunately, these hormones have become very expensive. We used to use bovine products. They're no longer available to us. They're all recombinant human products now, and the cost has just made them um, you know, somewhat uh, unattainable for us in private practice. Unless you're doing research, we're not going to be doing TSH or TRH stimulation tests to see whether the gland can respond. So from us, we have to put a puzzle together. We have to take some other tests along with those common clinical signs before we can arrive at a diagnosis of thyroid disease. So again, the first things you want to see, I, I keep repeating this, is common clinical signs, common laboratory findings, then we're going to add in some specific thyroid hormone tests. And the three that we have available to us most commonly in clinical practice will be total T4, free T4, and we'll define the difference of those in just a second, and endogenous TSH, or the TSH that's made directly from the pituitary gland. And for dogs, we'll call that C for canine, C-TSH. And then again, lastly, you're going to hopefully, if we define the first three things, and believe that our patient has hypothyroidism, we'll look to prove it, put the last piece of the puzzle together with an appropriate response to thyroxine therapy. Okay, so let's take a look at these three hormones and get us all caught up on this and what we need to be thinking about. Total T4 is the thyroxine that is made by the thyroid gland and released into the circulation. 99% of that will be bound to proteins to travel through the bloodstream to target organs. And the rest, that less than 1%, would be considered unbound or free T4, as you see the next category down. Uh, again, very easy over the years, the 35 plus years I've been a veterinarian, very easy for us to measure uh, total T4, both in our hospitals and at reference laboratories. Free T4 is that circulating unbound fraction of thyroxine. Uh, and again, depending on the literature you read, it's somewhere between 0.1 to 1% that circulates. That is the active thyroid, a thyroid that diffuses into cells, target organs, that is then converted to T3 and becomes active thyroid hormone and drives whatever that metabolic or catabolic response is in the target organ or tissue. Then again, that's been a little bit more difficult to get measured. Historically, it's been really at reference labs only. And we'll talk to you a little bit today about the fact that you can now measure both total T4 and free T4 in your own clinics. TSH, again, endogenous or canine TSH is that that's secreted by the pituitary gland in response to a lowering or a lack of thyroid hormone. Body senses that it doesn't have, or not the body, but the brain and the pituitary and hypothalamus uh, senses it doesn't have enough thyroid hormone, so it tries to make more by increasing this endogenous TSH. And just like the first two, historically, we've had very little ability to measure this hormone outside of reference laboratories, uh, but we do now have the ability to, to again, measure it and uh, interpret it within our own clinics. So again, that's the puzzle we try to put together, is taking a piece of these three hormones and saying, what combination or all of these do we need to see to hopefully put together this diagnosis of hypothyroidism? So let's take a look at what the last 20 plus years has taught us about these tests and how we can use them to make this diagnosis. So total T4, again, historically the test we've probably done the most with, is a pretty sensitive screening test. 
again, that means that most patients that have hypothyroidism, as you see on this bar graph, will test low when you screen them for a total T4. Uh, the sensitivity is 95%. What that basically means is, take a look at this big red box. I don't know about you guys, but I hate statistics. They drive me crazy. And I've got my own way of trying to interpret these. Hopefully it's the correct way. But again, I'm going to make it easier for you guys by saying sensitivity would be looking at this big red box. And here you see some hypothyroid dogs that are in the red box. They are in the normal range. So those would be considered false negatives or false normals, if you will. But there's very few of them. You know, there's not many of them here. So actually, some are outside the box. These are going to be your false negatives. Again, not many of them. That says, hey, trust the negative result or trust the normal result. So again, almost all of your thyroid dogs will be below normal, where most of your other dogs will be, or normal dogs will have a T4 in the normal range. Specificity for the total T4 test is not as good. Specificity means false positives. You have about 20% of the patients you test that will be falsely positive for hypothyroidism. They'll be below the normal cutoff values. Again, most of these dogs are truly hypothyroid, but as you can see, some clinically normal dogs and some dogs that have other illnesses or other factors that they are euthyroid will test with a deficiency in T4. So unfortunately, you cannot trust the positive result as much. And that's why we can't use a low T4 to confirm this diagnosis. We can screen, and if you have a normal T4, we think you probably have this, but if you have a low T4, we cannot confirm. Why do we see these normal patients down here? In some cases, it's a daily fluctuation in normal patients where they spend some of the day, or every third day, they might have a couple hours where they're below the norm. If you happen to test them at that time, you're gonna see a patient with a falsely declined T4. Sight hounds, your greyhounds, your whippets, and those guys have lower reference ranges because of the breed. As we get older, we make less thyroid. So again, the older the patient, the more likely that a lower T4 could be a false positive. Uh, the effects of non-thyroidal illnesses, again, as you get ill, you have more of a problem with it falsely lowering your T4. You guys know that called euthyroid sick syndrome, that a percentage of patients and the more severe the illness, the more likely it is to be associated with a reduction in T4. And then lastly, concurrent medications. We're all aware of anti-seizure medications, certain antibiotics like trimethoprim sulfa, NSAIDs, diuretics. All of these can also be associated with a false lowering of your T4 values. So again, a great screening test, sensitive, trust the negative, but not a great uh, you know, confirmatory test. You cannot necessarily trust the low T4. Now, what about these guys that popped up here? I kind of alluded to them before. There was uh, some outliers here that are outside the normal range. Yet, if you look, they're patients that have hypothyroidism. How do we wrap ourselves around these guys? These would be your patients that have um, thyroiditis. Again, autoimmune thyroiditis. They're making antibodies against T4. And the assay then picks up on that. And it gets confused because these antibodies are interpreted as T4 and it falsely elevates the value. So anytime you see a patient that has all those common clinical things, and if their T4 is excessively elevated, it certainly should make you think, hey, that's not appropriate. Why would it be high? I'm thinking it's low. Again, think about thyroid autoantibodies, and you can then request that a test be done to confirm that because those patients still, they actually have a high T4, but they are hypothyroid patients. Okay, that's T4. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Let's look at free T4, another screening test. It's even more sensitive. It's a better test in many ways compared to total T4. When you look at the sensitivity of this test, here's our hypothyroid dogs. Almost all of them test low on a free T4, 98%. Only a small fraction, 2%, will test in the normal range. So again, very rare false negatives. And that is great because that allows us to, again, trust the negative. You get a patient with a normal T4, free T4, I'm sorry, it's very unlikely to have hypothyroidism. Good screening test. 
Now, when you look at the other things we talked about, what about specificity? It's better than total T4. It raises that specificity up to about 93%. So there's less false positives. Again, there are still a few clinically normal patients that fall into the low range. There are less euthyroid sick patients, or again, non-thyroidal illness patients, if you will, that fall into this range. Its specificity is about 93%. So only about 7% of these guys would be false positives. Still doesn't give you enough ammunition to confirm hypothyroidism, but again, it's a better test to screen and to make yourself suspicious that you have it. It also takes out several things. There's less daily fluctuation. There's less effect in sight hounds. There's less effect with age. There's less effect with severe, I'm sorry, with non thyroidal illnesses, unless it's really severe. And then lastly, there's uh, less concurrent medication effects with this. And if you notice, nobody tested positive up here. If you have T4 autoantibodies, that's not going to reflect on your free T4 test. So you can eliminate that as a confounding factor. So again, in essence, free T4 is a better test, screening test, and a little bit more specific test than total T4. Why don't we use it more often? Well, number one, it was never available to us in our own clinics. Number two, the methodology that we uh, initially started with, the equilibrium dialysis testing, were things you had to send out to a lab. It took multiple days to get back. Why was that? Because each test had to be done individually with a laboratory technician. It took multiple days to get a result for equilibrium dialysis. Um, about a 15 years ago or so, it, it became uh, apparent to us in a paper that maybe we didn't have to do equilibrium dialysis for all of these tests and laboratories like uh, IDEX especially initially, and then Antec started doing automated. So we no, no longer had to assign a lab test or lab tech to each one of your tests. Uh, they were able to do chemilucent tests and show that they were pretty comparable tests as, as far as results went. So laboratories could now do mass automation and get us back uh, quicker results. Um, that all said, there's a current paper that just came out of Israel that suggests that it was especially with really sick euthyroid patients that it still may have more of a drop into the subnormal range. So again, the specificity as you get more severely ill may not be as good. But again, free T4 overall is a better test if we could make it affordable and if we could make it um, something that we could get back in a timely manner. And we'll talk about that here in a second. So those were your screening tests. Again, those were tests that we could say, hey, we can rule out the disease with patients in the normal range in almost all circumstances. But we still wanna confirm the disease. We want a specific test. And that's what this endogenous or canine TSH does for us. It's not as reliable of a screening test because it has false negatives as you'll see, but it's a much more specific test because we don't see as many false positives. So using the same sort of statistical little windows I put in here for you, if you look here, Patients that have normal or subnormal TSH levels are much more likely to be clinically normal or euthyroid. Well, that would make sense. They wouldn't have an elevation in their TSH if they didn't need it. But look at the hypothyroid dogs that fall down here into the normal range again. Unfortunately, about 30% of hypothyroid individuals will actually uh, test normal or subnormal for TSH levels. So that makes it a test that lacks sensitivity. You can't trust the normal or the negative, lots of false negatives. But if we look at, again, specificity, the blue box, most of your thyroid patients are up here, but less commonly do you see the clinical normal. These are outliers for non thyroidal illness here and for clinically normal patients. So about 90 plus percent of the patients that have an elevation in TSH will truly be hypothyroid patients. That's good specificity. That says trust the positive, trust the elevation. That's gonna be a hypothyroid dog. So now if you have the ability to do multiple assays and you take either a T4, total T4, or even better yet, you take a free T4 and you combine it with a TSH level, 
that raises specificity and sensitivity both into the high 90s. So your best way to diagnose hypothyroidism in today's day of age is a combination of either using T4, TSH, or even preferably free T4 and TSH. That's going to clinically confirm our diagnosis of hypothyroidism for us. And it doesn't add a lot more to cost to do that extra test. And again, it's going to hopefully eliminate you over-diagnosing this disease and treating patients that don't need to be treated. The other really nice thing about TSH is that you can use it as a monitoring tool, as you'll see here in a little bit. Um, you know, in the past, we've always used clinical response and a T4, a post-pill T4 value. And that may not be the best way to monitor success for therapy in hypothyroidism. Think about it. If you're treating a patient who needs T4, they're thyroid deficient, you're giving them T4, the normal physiologic response should be for their brain to know we're supplementing this, and it should start shutting down the production of TSH. It should return it down to the normal range as you see it coming down in this big black arrow. And again, if we can see that as occurring in a patient that we're treating, it's a very, very nice monitoring tool. And it doesn't have anything to do with, you don't have to do timing after post pill. It doesn't have anything to do with uh, oral bioavailability on a day-to-day -day basis of T4. This is something that takes time to occur, but you can't shut this mechanism off. Your TSH will begin to drop consistently to the normal range once you're giving the right dose and you're giving enough thyroid supplementation. So it's a really valuable thing, I think, to have a value when you make a diagnosis. How high is it so that I can track it coming down to prove efficacy of therapy? All right, speaking of therapy, let's go ahead and spend just a couple of minutes on that. Nothing's really changed that much in therapy. We're still going to use synthetic T4, levothyroxine, and patients that we prove have hypothyroidism will be treated for life. They're not going to spontaneously grow back or return function to their thyroid gland. There are two veterinary levothyroxine products that are FDA approved. The FDA very much frowns upon us not using these products. There's concern that the other products on the market maybe weren't the best products out there. So we really want to go through FDA testing and use FDA approved canine medications. The two are Thyrotabs and Thyrocare. You see them both here. Thyrotabs in the white bottles, Thyrocare in the green bottles. You guys are all aware they come in 0.1 increment tablets, usually from 0.1 up to one milligram of uh, levothyroxine. Uh, the dose has not really changed over the years. It's somewhere between 0.02 to 0.04 milligrams per kilogram. And most of us start off twice a day. There are some patients that maybe would be fine with once a day thyroid supplementation. I like to use it twice a day to see a clinical response, to see an improvement in those common signs, to see an improvement in those common lab findings like my uh, lipid levels come down. And then most importantly, I'd like to see an increase in my total T4 and also a reduction, especially a reduction in that TSH level, showing me that everything's trending in the right directions and that would become a well-controlled patient. Once I see that on twice a day treatment, I think it's fine if you want to try to back off to once a day. Uh, again, most of the time these patients are safely treated twice a day at the expense Although it may be slightly higher to be on twice a day, these are not very expensive long-term medications. What I do once I make a diagnosis and start a patient on BID therapy, I schedule them back in in one month. Now, it's going to take at least a couple of weeks to see some of the common things go away, to see the patient more bright, more energetic. Um, again, maybe start losing some weight based on your, your hospital scale. But it can take months for the dermatologic conditions to improve. So never feel that you're not making appropriate progress if your skin changes are not improving for the first three to four months. As long as everything else is getting better and your TSH levels coming down, your total T4 levels going up on therapy, you, you hold the, the course steady. Uh, you give the dermatologic uh, changes time to improve. If you find that you're not getting improvement in those common signs, 
Uh, we desire for our T4 level, if you come down to this line right here, for monitoring total T4s, we like to do them four to six hours post pill, should always be done at the same time. So if you choose four hours or four and a half or five, always do them at the same time with each subsequent retesting. But we'd like to see patients who are being supplemented adequately get up to around four micrograms per DL, the high end of the normal range. Um, and we'd also like to see, again, by monitoring TSH and comparing it to what we were before, we'd like to see these patients come back down to the normal range and even to the low end of it. If you're taking enough exogenous thyroid, you should see your TSH, again, turn off and come down to somewhere down around 0.03 micrograms per liter or lower. It might say non-detectable, which would be fine. Uh, in those situations, if we don't see adequate response, you will either increase or decrease your dosage by 25%, go another month and retest again. Dr. Dixon wrote a great paper again in 2002 showing us these are our target goals. If we can get a total T4 four to six hours around four and get a TSH level that's in the low normal range or below, less than 0.03, that should equate to good clinical improvement. These patients should be well controlled. Once they're stable, it's not a disease that you need to do a lot of work with unless the owner sees a change. I would say come back in twice a year, every six months, and certainly retest again these parameters. So pretty easy disease to treat and pretty easy to follow up. Do we get treatment failures? They're pretty uncommon if your diagnosis is correct. I mean, some patients do have owner noncompliance or patients that don't take drugs well. Um, some patients do have variable absorption of levothyroxine, but that seems to be a day-to-day -day thing. Most of them, again, will even that out over time. That's why sometimes that total T4 value on any given day might not be your best indication of thyroid control. That's why your TSH is probably a better assay that really tells you how well the patient's being treated. Adverse effects are pretty uncommon unless we're giving significantly more levothyroxine that we need to. If they look like a hyperthyroid cat, they're eating like crazy, they're losing weight, they're becoming hyperactive, their hair coat's getting fluffy and like Bill the scruffy cat. They have GI signs, vomiting, diarrhea, they develop PUPD. Uh, all of those things would suggest, just like they would in an older cat, that we're getting too much levothyroxine. We would go ahead and do our testing if we were significantly above those values. Um, you know, the, above the T4 value of four, then we would want to back the dose off. Cool. So guys, in summary, what we're looking at here is, again, I can't I'll go through each one of these six points. Number one, make sure you're testing patients that have common history, common clinical signs. And again, their basic laboratory tests show you things like hyperlipidemia. If you don't have those common things, you're likely going to overdiagnose this disease. And that's a reason why we should never just randomly add T4s on as a geriatric screen. You will overdiagnose the disease if you do. Number two, we know that total T4 for most uncomplicated cases is probably fine. If they look like a hypothyroid dog, all the common features are there. You want to do just a total T4 and it's low. You're probably correct. But again, I would certainly say you should think about using a TSH to confirm that and also establish a baseline for treatment. Free T4 is the more accurate test, we've already said. If you have a complicated case or a sight hound or a dog on drugs, you know, again, you certainly may want to preferentially put more importance on the free T4. In those instances, honestly, I would do a T4 and a free T4. And again, if everything lines up and looks like it's thyroid, I want to next look to my TSH. I'm going to probably run all three samples in a complicated patient or a patient with other illness and make sure that all three things then line up the way that they should to make this diagnosis. If your total T4 or your free T4 is low, I've already mentioned again, please confirm with an endogenous or canine TSH. Uh, if you find that it is normal, it can't confirm the diagnosis. Remember we said 30% of those patients can be normal, but in the other 70%, you can be really certain that's a disease they have. In the 30%, you're not sure if the TSH comes back in the normal range. Look at the rest of the picture. Do they have the common signs? Do they have hyperlipidemia? 
Do they have dermatologic changes? 90% of them do. And then is my T4 and free T4 low? In those circumstances, you can probably rest assured your patient is hypothyroid. And the last proof of the pudding will be, you'll see your response to therapy. Again, I've already mentioned doing the combination of all three tests, I think is best, especially if you have non-thyroidal illnesses. Where you choose to do those is up to you. You can certainly send those out to a laboratory. I, as an internist, prefer accuracy. Obviously, that's important to us to get the right diagnosis. I like simplicity, though. I like when I can get information back quickly and I can trust it. And as a practice owner, I like cost containment. I like to be able to keep things when I can, if they're accurate and simplistic, in-house and be able to give owners, again, immediate results that I can trust. That's why we're here with Zomedica today. You guys have maybe heard of the True Forma platform. This is a platform that they have that provides me accuracy, simplicity, and cost containment. When you look at the breakdown on prices, you know, it runs you about $125, your cost, uh, in this um, assay to do all three tests, or you can see individual prices. It's a cool technology in that it uh, doesn't uh, have any issues with hyperlipidemia or hemolysis. It's a platform called bulk acoustic wave resonation. And what that means is you've got an antibody impregnated resonation plate. You see it here. And once you have a certain weight on that plate and you put an electric current across it, the plate will resonate or move, if you will, at a certain frequency that we can record. Once you put in a sample, serum sample, plasma sample, we don't use whole blood. The other day, I think I may have said blood to somebody and uh, they were being literal and I wasn't. I just meant, you know, the stuff that comes out of the body, but we do need to use serum or plasma for most of, or for these type of testing. Once we put that into a self-contained cartridge, uh, these antibodies will grab on to our analyte of interest, either T4, free T4, TSH, if you have that cartridge in the machine. Once it grabs on to these other molecules of interest, it changes the frequency of resonation. The plate gets heavier and a heavier plate is going to free, is going to have a frequency that would be lower. And again, that can be a signal out, can be read, and then it can be interpreted through an algorithm that will tell us how many milligrams per DL, how many picomoles per liter of a certain substance do we have? So it's a cool technology. It's in your cell phones. It's in the aerospace industry. And it's a lot less expensive than chemiluminescence, way less expensive than equilibrium dialysis. And all the initial tests so far have shown us that it is accurate and precise for diagnosis of endocrine diseases. In fact, this Truforma machine that Zomatica has is about the size of a shoebox. It's, again, a self-contained cartridge, so no muss, no fuss. You plug it in, machine talks to you, even plays music to you, which is kind of cool. And uh, you don't have any reagents or things. These cartridges are sealed to mess with. All we have to do is put our sample in and get our uh, resonation values out that correlates it's been validated against the Emulite 2000, which is the chemiluminescence machine of choice for most major labs. Uh, and we can do not only thyroid tests, it does cortisol testing, it does endogenous ACTH testing for our Cushing's patients as well. So then the last two things in our summary, other than think about combining all of your tests, when you get an unexpected high total T4, think about autoantibodies. Again, those patients don't have hyperthyroidism. If they look like they're hypothyroid and they test like they're hyperthyroid, then you got to go ahead and, uh, again, submit a T4 autoantibody to Antec or IDEX or Michigan State, and that should clarify that issue that that patient truly is hypothyroid. And then lastly, again, be scientific. Be judicious about levothyroxine therapy. Make sure the patient is responding as you suspect that they would and getting better. This is a disease that patients, again, generally don't get euthanized from. But again, if you don't treat them properly, they may have an incomplete response. And we certainly don't want that. Uh, and if you treat them overly aggressive, you certainly could get uh, hyperthyroid type side effects. We don't want that. So be scientific, be judicious. Look at those values I mentioned. Total T4 should be up somewhere around four post pill if you're using micrograms per DL. And again, your TSH level should be coming down from its historical high down towards the low end of normal 
0.03 or lower. Um, so I think that's really what I have for you today. It's 150. Um, sometimes when I do this talk, I go through some case examples, but I think today I'd rather just take your guys' questions because I see there are lots of them. So I'm just going to fling through these cases real quick, guys. Give me a second. There's only four. There we go. So we're now going to answer questions. This was a hypothyroid saluki. And you can see the beautiful hair coat that's now been reestablished and a beautiful grooming job parted right to the side. Love it. If you have questions after this seminar, you can uh, always email me, oswald, uh, period, D-A-C-V-I-M at gmail.com.